I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be saying. But um, yeah, we want to make disciples. That's our main goal, to make disciples. Everything else is secondary. Why are we here? Why do we come every week? Because we want to make disciples. What do we want those disciples to look like? Yeshua. Look, our goal is not Torah. I want to make that really clear. Jesus, Yeshua, is the goal. And how did he live? According to Torah. You see the difference? It's the, the horse and cart issue. We like the cart, but the horse has to pull it. And what happens is sometimes people start to flip it. They're like, no, Torah is what we're here for. No, no. Torah follows. Yeshua is the one pulling it, and Torah is going to follow that. So we want to keep Torah. Why? Because Yeshua kept Torah. That's the reason. And if we flip those, I'll tell you what happens. I've seen it so many times. People come into the Hebrew roots, Torah movement, and before you know it, Jesus, Yeshua, who is he again? And he's become nothing. He's always going to be our focus. And that's where we're going to, we're going to be focusing. And I'm looking forward to uh, the word today. Part of what we do is we celebrate the feast. Why? Because Torah tells us, well, yeah, but because Yeshua did it, right? Because Yeshua kept the feast. We want to do tikkun olam, fix the world. We want to be good to our neighbors, etc. Yes, because Yeshua did it. That's why. Right? And so that's what we're, we're um, doing. And, you know, sometimes we have to embrace suffering for God's glory. We're not looking for it, but if it comes looking, we're going to embrace it and say, thank you, Lord, for these incredible teaching opportunities. All right, I talked about that. All right, let's move on. I'm excited about first or the book of John. So we've, uh, we've made it to verse 4. I'm really excited about this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. You are good. Thank you, Lord, for this new building. Thank you that your mercy is new every morning. And Lord, we thank you. that You've given us your Sabbath. You've given us this opportunity to come together, to, to fellowship together, to encourage one another, to bless each other. And we thank you that your spirit is moving in our midst. We pray all these things in Yeshua's great and awesome name. Amen. All right. We started in the beginning, right? We got through three ver three words. Um, then we talked about in the beginning was the Logos. And now we're going to talk about Yeshua. He is the light in a dark world. Yeshua is the light in a dark world. So we're going to get, get through uh, all together nine verses right now. We're pretty excited about this. <clears throat> So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was light of men. That's what we're going to focus on. It says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear a witness of the light, that all, <clears throat> that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. We're going to talk about John the Baptist a little bit later. But right now we're focusing on Yeshua. He is the light. Look at he, in him was life, life. In him was life. You know, it's interesting when we start talking about how did life begin. The, the scientists are pretty good at understanding how life works. I think it's awesome. The biologists, they've really figured this out. How does life work? And they can tell you and do all these different things, and I'm amazed. When it comes to how did life begin. That's when they're like, oh, uh, well, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and they don't know. They don't have an answer as to how life began. Because when we start looking at life, we see that it's incredibly complex. And it has a code in it, like your computer code, but even more sophisticated. And it's not happenstance. It's not random. When Charles Darwin was talking about the, uh, the evolution of the species. He imagined, like, they didn't know what a cell really was back then. They just thought it was kind of like a, a brick. 
And so he imagined these basic bricks. But now when we look inside of a cell, it's like a whole city. And you've got trucks and machines pulling things around on different roads. I kid you not, if you've ever seen the animation of the inside of a cell, it will blow your mind of the things that are happening inside. Just one cell. And then you can go deeper and smaller still until we finally get to DNA. And DNA is a highly complex written system that's intelligent. That's what it is. And so evolution has no explanation as how did it begin. Even guys um, that are just hardcore atheists, when pressed on this question, they say, well, uh, maybe it, it Maybe DNA somehow uh, got on the back of, of a, a crystal, or uh, maybe it was aliens. Yeah, that's it. And so they call it directed panspermia, that somehow life, DNA, it, it hitched a ride on a spaceship or something, or aliens came and they planted it here. And when you really start to press these guys, Carl Sagan, a round atheist, you know, all they can do is just push it back. Right? Okay, well, life somehow started here, but it was because somebody brought it here. Well, I would agree with you. Somebody did bring life here. You know the origin of that? Yeshua. He's the origin of life. He's the origin. In him was life. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Now, this is where it, it becomes really tempting to say, oh, well, John is just kind of using metaphoric language or allegorizing, but we're going to see that life and light are related. It's amazing. Look at the scriptures here. Psalm 104, you are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, who makes his angels spirits, who's his ministers a flame of fire. God is described as being covered in light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, I was teaching on John a couple of weeks ago, and there was a young man in, in, the, uh, in the audience, in the congregation, and he has trouble believing that Jesus is God. And I made it very clear. I'm like, you know, if you hold to that position, that's okay. You're entitled to your opinion, and we're not going to chase you out of here. But that our position at the Way Congregation is that Jesus is God, and we're not bending on that. All right? So if you hold to a different position, that's fine. If you want to sit down and have coffee, I'm happy to discuss it with you. That's great. But the Scripture is clear that Jesus is God. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah. I think John is trying to tell us something, right? This right here, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. If you have the essence of life in yourself, then you are God. If you are the fountainhead of life, that's about as primal as you can get. That's called creator. And that's what John is trying to tell us. Jesus is the creator. And life, the life was the light of men. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And we see that God is clothed with light. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. James says, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. The Father, a Father is an originator. In Italian, you talk about your parents, your genitori, right? They are your generators. They're the ones that got you started. Right? So who is the great generator in the sky? God. He's the one who is the source of all things, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And then Daniel has this incredible vision. He says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. 
His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Ezekiel describes it like this. Above the ferment over their heads was the likeness of a throne and appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness of a man, Adam, high above it. So Ezekiel is seeing this, this heavenly vision. He sees this throne, and there's someone who looks like Adam on the throne. Hmm, who could possibly look like Adam who's on this throne? Why would anybody look like Adam? Well, we know who it is. This is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Here's what's mind-blowing to think about. When God made us in his image and in his likeness, yes, he gave us his, his immaterial abstract attributes such as creativity, love, joy, peace, passion, sadness, all of these things we also have because we're like our creator, but he also made us his image. Is seeing someone who looks like Adam sitting there. But that's where, of course, the similarities stop. He says, from his, the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber. That's the Hebrew word, chashmal. It's electricity. God has fire mingled with electricity coming from his waist up. And from his waist down, with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downer, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. God is light. He is light. And then we're, just, we're, we're shown in graphic detail how that light is. And we're told that in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus, when he was transfigured, he went up on top of uh, Mount Hermon, I believe it was. And it says, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as a sound of many waters. He had on his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp wedged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Wow. This is Yeshua is not a created being. Yeshua is Iman. Yeshua is God with us. That's who he is. This is why. Yeshua. This is why we sing songs about Yeshua. If he were only a created being, I would not sing songs about him. I had this uh, really weird job some years ago. I was looking for work, couldn't find any. So I thought, well, maybe I'll try sales. And so uh, I was looking, this is before the internet. That was a long time ago. And I found a job working for Kirby Vacuum Cleaners. Well, let's just say it didn't last very long. Because we went in, they gave us all the training and some free pizza. That actually did motivate me to go. And and then like the first day we're 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 in for the meeting and we get out the songbooks and we start singing songs to the Kirby vacuum cleaner. And I'm like, Okay, I get it. We're supposed to be excited about the product and all, but I don't know if I can sing songs about a vacuum cleaner. It just didn't make any sense to me. And I might have stuck with that job if we hadn't sung songs about the vacuum cleaner. But uh, needless to say, I, I didn't stay with that job. <laughs> it was an experience, though, and the pizza, it filled me up a little bit. But we sing songs. We praise and worship our God. That's the difference. That's why we get excited about Yeshua, not because he's some created being that God made and said, here, you know, check out this guy. No, because God himself came in flesh. God himself went to the cross. God himself defeated death. You have to understand, again, from the, the perspective of a story, right? The, the, the greater you want your superhero to be, the badder the bad guy has to be, right? 
And so understand, Satan is a pretty amazing bad guy. He was made with, with uh, full of wisdom, complete in beauty, perfect in beauty. Right? He had full wisdom. He had a lot of smarts about him. And so to get out of that, to save the world, you needed somebody even greater. Who's greater than Satan? Only one. God. God is greater. And God came to save us. Now, thinking about that light again, here's where it gets pretty exciting. And I, I wrote about this in my book, Corrupting the Image, Volume 1, some years ago. I was, I was thinking about all these different things, and I was looking at Scripture, and I was like, wait a second. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. He did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. Has anybody ever seen the statue of Moses by Michelangelo? If you've ever seen that, he has little horns in his head. And it's like, wait, why does he have horns in his head? Why would Michelangelo do that? Because in the, in the Vulgate, the Latin translation, they took this word karan, and they understood it to mean horns. And the word karan is the same as keren, which means horns. But here the word karan means to shine forth. So it's like something protruding. That's what horns do. And so they just messed up on the translation, and they put horns instead of shine, and so now Moses has horns. But the word is shine. Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He was in God's presence. So he was getting what? God's light, a major dose of God's light. And what was happening is that light was going into him, and then it was coming out of him. Now, this is, again, where I kind of geeked out. I'm like, this is so cool. I did some research, and it turns out that DNA both absorbs light and it re-emits that light. It was around 1923, Ukrainian biologist Alexander Gravisht discovered that living things such as onions and yeast produce ultra-weak photon emission. That's an actual picture of, uh, of uh, a yeast uh, ex giving off this, this light here. So Russian scientists around 1950 discovered an ultra-weak photon emission from living organisms. Italian nuclear physicist El Coli et al. in 1955 by chance discovered a bioluminescence of seedlings. So it was around the same time they started discovering this. And it turns out that biophotons are single quanta being permanently and continuously emitted by all living systems. So everything that's alive is emitting a tiny dose of light. Now, we generally can't see that. We generally can't see that. But it was a school of medicine at Kanazawa University. They said all organic life absorbs, emits, and processes light. Biophoton emission or spontaneous ultra-weak light emission has been observed from almost all, all living organisms. So what's happening is we are getting light from the sun, right? It's going into us, and then it's being re-emitted. When Moses was in the presence of God, he was absorbing that light, God's light, which is greater than the sun, stronger, pure. He was taking in that light, and then it was coming back out of his DNA. I think that's really, really cool. Now, the implications of this is that if Moses, hello, check, if Moses was absorbing and then re emitting God's light, hmm, who else might have? Possibly Adam. Maybe Adam and Eve were actually emitting light. So it's interesting, the rabbis already caught on to this. Like, they're way ahead of us on so many things. It's really incredible. So they picked up on this, this pun, this wordplay. So in uh, Rabbi Meir's Torah, it's written, instead of uh, garments of skin, or with an ayin, 
it was written garments of light with an olive. So they, they figured this out. Uh, the early church fathers, they talk about in the age to come that instead of coarse, our coarse material fabrics are shadows of the true, the robes of light our realities and are conformed to spiritual bodies, even here as a mist may envelop a tree. She, the believer, had received a garment of light instead of a dress, clothed with light itself, and instead of precious stones, her head adorned with shining stars. For instead of the clothing which we have, she had light. So says Methodius. Wow. So Adam and Eve were absorbing God's light and then re emitting God's light. The big difference is that they did not have any decay or degeneration or death in their bodies. They were able to fully take in God's light and then re-emit God's light. Remember what happened to Moses? It says that he came, his face was shining, and then what did he do? He put a veil over his face. Why? Because that glory was fading away. He was in God's presence. And then when he came out of God's presence, this glow that he had began to fade. We're not told how, but, you know, once you're not in the source, then it begins to fade away back to zero or back to normal amounts that we have today. But in the age to come, we're going to be fully in God's presence. I am kind of excited about that. So, Adam, when he sinned, he noticed something. Something changed. Something changed in Adam. Paul tells us, for since through Adam or man is death, also through man is arising again from the dead. For even as in Adam all die, so also in the Christ shall all be made alive. Paul says in Romans 5, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So spread to all men because all sinned yet death reigned from adam to moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of adam who was a type of the one who was to come but the free gift is not like the trespass for if many died through one man's trespass how many more will we made alive in him we're told that yeshua came as that new man and here's where it gets kind of cool he was born into the human race, yes, but of course, he was in some way different. We know that he was connected genetically to humanity. God saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed, sperma, sperm, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, right? So the, the scriptures are clear that Jesus was kinetic, connected genetically to the forefathers. But something was different about his conception. And the, the angel says to Mary, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the Son, and shall call his name Jesus. How does this happen? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. So something, something different happened with Yeshua. So let's just let's geek out a little bit and understand what is going on. Inside of seed, what is inside of a seed? Think about a watermelon seed. You got the husk on the outside, and you got the germ on the inside. Then you get down to the chromosomes, the genes, and they get down to the double helix. There's something happening in there. All right, so there's information. When we go from the double helix, we've all seen that, that double ladder, but what's inside of there? There's nucleic acids, A, G, T, and C, nucleic acids. But what's, what's smaller than that? What's beyond that? Information. It's information. Information is a non-material um, entity. Information is a non-material entity. And this blew my mind when I started thinking about, I'm like, oh, wow, inside of something physical, 
is something not physical. I think all of us carry a cell phone. Most of us, some of us have finally gotten up to date and gotten a smartphone. Good job. You really should. They're great. Anyway, I digress. But inside that device, that piece of hardware that you're holding in your hand, what really is making it tick? Why does Google get paid billions? It's not for the hardware, it's for the software. And software exists where? On the cloud. Yeah, but there's some physical thing that's holding this information. If we could go and look inside those servers, we'd find that we can't see anything. It's invisible to us, but it's there. It's holding information. We need it. And we send little packets of information all the time. So too, inside of us, inside your DNA, there's information. Dr. Werner Gitt says in the beginning was information. He says that information requires a material medium for storage. That's the, the server somewhere. If one writes some information with chalk on a chalkboard, the chalk is the material carrier. If it is wiped off, the total quantity of chalk is still there, but the information has vanished. He says the fundamental quality information is a non-material entity. And so our information is stored in our DNA, our genes, and our chromosomes. So thinking about the incarnation, how is Jesus different genetically? We're told that a son will inherit an identical copy of his father's Y chromosome, right? So again, women have XX, men have XY, right? You get one from your mother, one from your father. In the case of a man, you always have a Y chromosome. And little secret, this is how we know that there's only two genders. There's XY or XX. It's really simple, right? It's very simple. Those are your two options. There's not other options. There's no such thing as non-binary. So a son will inherit an identical copy of his father's Y chromosome. And this copy is also essentially identical to the Y chromosomes carried by all his paternal forefathers. So it's Neil Bradman and Mark Thomas. They wrote a paper called Why Why? The, the Y chromosome and in the study of human evolution, migration, and prehistory. I don't know where they stand uh, on the question of God. I have no idea, but it's interesting. They say, translated into modern genetic terms, Adam passed a copy of his Y chromosome to Seth. Seth passed a copy of his Y chromosome to Enosh, and so on until Noah was born carrying a copy of Adam's Y chromosome. Okay, this is interesting, but okay, but so what? So we all have Adam's Y chromosome. Men, every one of us have an identical copy of Adam's Y chromosome. Do you get that? We all have that same thing. But then these two, Bradman and Thomas, they suggest that the Y chromosome that we all carry, it contains a record of an event inside that Y chromosome that every man on the planet has that's identical to Adam's Y chromosome, there's some record of an event in the life of the man who passed on the current Y chromosome. Hmm, what could that event possibly be? What could the big thing be that got passed on into our DNA, into our Y chromosome? Death, maybe? Could it be that death is what has been passed? And guess who didn't have Adam's Y chromosome, Yeshua. Oh, maybe that's why we had to have virgin birth. Interesting. It's all right there. So Yeshua comes. He is God. He is Emmanuel, God in the flesh. He dwelt among us, right? And we've seen his light. Verse 5, light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Something happened when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit. Something happened inside them. Now, they didn't keel over that very moment. 
but they went from being perfect, no flaws in the code, no errors in their genetic writing, absolutely perfect, to somehow imperfect. And when that happened, when that little tiny error entered in, they went from being immortal to now mortal. Death, degeneration, decay, it entered in. Think of a, a photocopier. If you've ever made a photocopy in your life, I'm sure you have. Have you ever made a photocopy of a photocopy? Right? You already know that the photocopy of the original is not as good. And then you make a photocopy of the photocopy, and what happens? You keep losing data. There's information loss. Until eventually, if you keep making photocopies of that, you'll have something you can't even distinguish. It doesn't make any sense at all. That's where we are. We're becoming more mutant than our parents because we keep losing information. Every time we make a copy of a copy of a copy that was already defective, and we become more mutant. So parents, if you're wondering, yes, your kids are mutants. But you are too, so sorry about that. Now, light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In Isaiah 8, it says, When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God. And look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they'll be driven into darkness. Now, this is spoken of, of the people who are living up in the north. This is spoken specifically to the northern kingdom of Israel, the northern house of Israel, up by the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his ministry. Not too far north of that is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon, according to various texts, are where the 200 watchers came down in the days of Noah, or the days of Herod. And now I wrote a whole book on this, okay, so I won't, I won't give you all the details. But this became known as the land of Bashan, King Og of Bashan, this giant guy was there. And it was the headquarters of the god, uh, according to the Ugaritic texts, there was a deified God of the dead who lived on Mount Hermon, uh, just as the Bible says. So this area is the land of darkness, but it's Yeshua who lights up the shadow land of death. In Matthew 4, it says, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Now this is, of course, taken from Isaiah chapter 9. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Now we talk about Jesus being the light of the world, and you know every time that month called December comes by, a lot of people put up light and all kinds of stuff. I'm not here to debate that right now. But the point here is that we can sort of allegorize this whole thing. Yeah, Jesus is the light of the world and all that stuff. But I want to impress upon you that Jesus is literally the light of the world. Yes, spiritually, awesome. Metaphorically, yes, it's true. All those things are true. But also, he was the light. Now, I think if we could have put on our, our spiritual goggles back then, and you're looking around, you're like, man, it's dark here. And you would have seen demons walking around because eventually they did start to manifest because it was a dark place and that was the headquarters of the dark place what is at the base of mount hermon caesarea philippi which has the gates of hades jesus took who there his disciples to the gates of hades and he said these gates will not prevail the first century apocalyptus, the Jewish apocalyptus, thought that the gates of Hades were going to open up at any moment and that hordes of these dark demonic creatures were going to come out shooting their arrows. 
And Jesus took his crew there and said, not today, not on my watch. It's not going to happen. The darkness isn't going to prevail at the moment. Now we know, according to Revelation chapter 9, that eventually those gates are going to open up. And there's a time for that. It's called the Great Tribulation. It's going to be lousy, like lousier than any time on in human history. But Jesus came. I think the demons always could recognize Yeshua because he was the light. Maybe they could see his aura or whatever. They could see something. They could see something that were like, oh, oh we know who you are. Because it was obvious to them. It wasn't obvious to people because we're often blind, but they could see it. And so as Scripture is talking about, those who sat in the region and shadow of death, Mount Hermon, that whole area was called the land of Bashan. Bashan is the Akkadian word for snake dragon, Bashmu. Lots of interesting details on that. I won't go into all of them right now. So, Jesus comes. He doesn't have Adam's corrupted Y chromosome. He's got a new Y chromosome straight from the Holy Spirit. He's coming. He is the light shining in the darkness, specifically in that area, but also the entire world. And now we're told Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. Peter, 1 Peter, born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word, through the logos of God, which lives and abides forever. We have a seed problem. We need a new seed. Why? Because we're born... Thanks to Adam and Eve, and we're a copy of a copy of a copy. We are born of corruptible seed, but we need to be born again of incorruptible seed. See the difference there? We need the new birth. Now, I I came across this, which again blew my mind. Uh, This guy named Chris uh, out of Reno, Nevada. Uh, You can check it out there, independent.co.uk, etc., You can check that out if you don't believe me. But this guy named Chris had leukemia, and that's a big problem. So he needed a donor. And so a German donor gave some bone marrow, and then he got it and started to get better, et cetera. Well, this forensics lab was tracking his progress to see the before and after. And what they noted blew their minds. So three months after his bone marrow transplant, Chris of Reno, Nevada, learned that the DNA in his blood, the DNA in his blood, had been replaced by the DNA of his donor. All of the DNA in his semen as well belonged to his donor. And so Chris said, I thought that was pretty incredible that I can disappear, and someone else can appear. Wow. Okay, so we need to be born again. Not of corruptible seed. How do you get corruptible seed? Don't do anything. Just be born. That's all you had to do. Congratulations. You already got that. But now you need incorruptible seed. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, that's the big, big question. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven... So also are those who are of heaven, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam. We're all born with his image. We shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So, yeah, we're connected genetically to Adam, but we also have Jesus' DNA. 
in Isaiah 53, you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, his zera. Or no one having been born again continues to sin for the seed of God dwells in him. <clears throat> we need to be born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible from the logos of God, the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That is what we need. So the new birth, it's not only a clearing of our debts. I'm really glad about the clearing of the debts. The cross did many good things for us, many good things. And it did clear the debt of sin. Hallelujah. But there's another aspect that we get to take possession of our new bodies with their corrected DNA in heaven. And until that time, we have the Holy Spirit as a down human. I'm pretty excited about that. I don't know about you, but we get new bodies. And then imagine we're going to be in God's presence and his light is going to be shining on us. Jesus said that that the righteous will shine like their father. They're going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. We are going to have resplendent, glorious bodies. If you've not been feeling very bright lately, don't worry. It's going to change. You're going to get better. You're going to get brighter. I guarantee it. We're going to have that. Now, this Isaiah 26, very cool passage. Um, so, my translation here, it says, your dead will live, my corpse they will rise, wake up and rejoice, O oh, dwellers of the dust, because the dew of light is your dew. This is parallel to what Daniel says. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, yakutsu. Those who are wise shall shine. In the Greek, they're eklampo. They're going to they're gonna shine out like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We are going to shine. We're going to be equal to the angels in the age to come. But looking back here at Isaiah 20, 15, rejoice, O you dwellers of the dust, because your dew, what is dew? Dew is moisture that comes down from heaven. It coagulates, etc., and it's then you know, little drops of water on the grass in the morning. So when you have that, that experience of waking up after a night, there's now something on you. And what this verse is saying is, because the dew of light is your dew, that, that little bit of clothing, that something that's on you is light. That's what you're going to wake up to. Anyway, See that in the, the Vulgate as well, your dew is light or brilliance. Lucis is the word. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. We have that to look forward to. How do we get that? How does a person get that? Then the righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear let him hear. How do you get that new body? It's really simple. It's very simple. You recognize, you admit, you confess. You're like, you know what? I think I blew it. I think I've done some stupid things. I've made a lot of mistakes. The Bible calls that sin, transgression, iniquity. That I have strayed from God's ways. Sometimes small ways, sometimes Big ways. Sometimes I almost make it through a day, and sometimes I'm not even close. But there's a God who loves me and gave himself for me to pay the penalty of my sins. And so I confess. I admit it. I acknowledge it. I'm not trying to hide it anymore. And I'm like, here you go. I did it. I admit it. And then we ask him, Lord, would you? Forgive me. I'm sorry. I don't want to go that direction anymore. I don't want to do those things anymore. I want to live according to your word. And if I trip and I fall, I'm told that a righteous man gets up seven times. If I blow it tomorrow, then I'm going to 
come back and say, Lord, forgive me. It's that simple. And then ask Yeshua, Lord, be my king. I, I want you to be my king. I'm going to pledge my fealty, my loyalty to you. Be my king. And that's it. It's that simple. That's where it begins. You acknowledge who you are. You acknowledge where you've been, what you've done. And you say, I don't want to do that anymore. I want a new path. I want a new path. I want God's path because I want that new DNA. I want to be clothed in light. I want to shine as the sun in the kingdom of my Father. I want to wake up and, and shine like the brightness of the firmament. I want the, the dew of lights to be my dew when I wake into resurrection. That is what we want. That is our greatest desire. Because you can have a lot of cool things in this life, but guess what? We all die. The richest guys all die. I once heard an uh, interview with Steve Jobs, of course, before he passed. He died, what, 56, 57, something like that, young man. And he said, I don't want to be the richest guy in the graveyard. I think he probably is in that graveyard. He's the richest guy. But you know what? He's dead. And he didn't want that. He realized, if I'm dead, what do I have? So you can have all the riches, all the glory, all the fame. But how long does it last? Maybe you get it for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe even 70 years you enjoy these things. Maybe you've, you're really amazing. You make it 80, 90, 100. You get to enjoy just the incredible life. But then we all still die. 100% mortality rate. 